All right. Well, thanks a lot again, Jordan, for setting up these webinars. These are great. I wish we'd done this uh, 10 years ago. So aloha and good morning. It's good afternoon and good, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. So today I'm going to want to give an overview of our petroleum vapor intrusion guidance. I'm calling this facts, fallacies, and implications. And a lot of this is from things that I've learned over the years, the last 20 years, I guess, working with vapor intrusion. First, quick acknowledgments. I see lots of regulators, consultants, oil company scientists over the past 20 years been working on this subject. I got lucky, I guess, in a way, at joining in in the mid 90s. I happened to be in Massachusetts working when they were getting their program going with vapor intrusion. It's one of the first in the country. The field study I'm going to discuss during this presentation we talked about before was funded through a, a grant to our office from US EPA. It wasn't specific to the field study, but just to our office, and then we can use the money as we wish doing field research. As Jordan mentioned, this is the third in a series of vapor intrusion webinars. Uh, the first, back in February, we talked about climate-based vapor intrusion risk regions, as we call them, and region-specific screening levels, just to point out differences between vapor intrusion risk, say, between upstate New York, where it, a lot of heating and buildings and such, versus here in Hawaii, where it's buildings are air-conditioned or it's tropical and essentially no heating during the year. The second webinar, Mort Smith and Harry O'Neill, joined us and gave presentations on the collection and interpretation of active and passive soil gas samples. This one, we're focusing on petroleum vapor intrusion. I hope to have another one later on this year where we get in some experts from the mainland and talk about the need for a collection of long duration indoor air samples. So think about indoor air samples collected over several days, high purge volume soil gas samples, where we're collecting soil gas samples sub-slab in hundreds or even thousands of, of liters just to get more representative samples with respect to vapor intrusion. But today, I want to here's an outline for today's webinar. I'm going to go over vapor intrusion basics, and it is really simple. Vapor intrusion is, in spite of some of the equations and such. So I've got one slide for that. I want to talk also about the evolution of vapor intrusion science, and this gets back into the facts, semi semi facts and fallacies, and we'll go into after that and just things that we've learned over the last 20 years, and still a few fallacies I think that we're still dealing with and trying to get a better handle on. So a lot of the, you know, the fallacies I talk about were, were essentially my own, that I think we've overcome a lot of them and we're still getting data on those. As some of the references, you know, we, our vapor intrusion action levels, as we call them here in Hawaii, same thing as screening levels, uh, those are published in our evaluation of environmental hazards at sites with the contaminated soil and groundwater guidance. And for people in California, it's very similar to the, the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Board's ESLs, environmental screening levels. I was helped with those when I worked with that office. Uh, we talk about collection of soil gas samples and other issues dealing with vapor intrusion in addition in our technical guidance manual. And then the field study we carried out in 2011, 2012, published in 2013, Field Investigation of the Chemistry and Toxicity of TPH and Petroleum Vapors. is also posted to our webpage. We'll be looking at that study we did in more detail. And some other recent additional TBI, Petroleum Vapor Intrusion References, kind of impetus for you know, putting on this webinar. The US EPA published their technical guide for addressing petroleum vapor intrusion at UST size, but really you know, the theory behind it applies to most petroleum sites in general. That just came out in June of this year, and it's been ongoing for several years. You probably know we provided comments on it. Then ITRC published their petroleum vapor intrusion guidance uh, last year, and their document in particular goes into a lot more detail about low-risk sites, how to screen out low-risk sites, in more detail on those. We'll, we'll talk about that later also. ITRC, if you're not familiar with it, it's a public-private coalition of regulators, consultants, industry representatives. Someone from our office was on the team that prepared that guidance. Vapor intrusion basics uh, is in one slide. It's actually it's pretty simple. Uh, you have a release from a tank, a pipeline, or whatever, of some volatile chemical, usually liquid, gasoline, and chlorinated solvents, dry cleaning solvents, the most common. It migrates down through the Vado zone, and if shallow groundwater, so it hits groundwater. If it's a light product like petroleum, it'll spread out on top of groundwater, producing a light non-aqueous phase liquid l apple. Denser chemicals like dry cleaning solvent could sink down within the groundwater. 
you know, these will, as groundwater flows under the side, it, it picks up some of these contaminants and creates a dissolved phase plume that migrates away from the original release area. You'll get a lot of vapors coming off the original release area, especially where you have the product still in the VATO zone. But as you move away from the heavily contaminated area over the dissolved phase plume, you, you can also get vapors coming up just from the dissolved phase plume, even if no freed product is, is present. Now, if the buildings are over top of these areas, then wind, exhaust fans, heating, not so much here, can under-pressurize a building. If there are cracks and gaps in the floor, then the building can actually pull vapors up through the bottom of the floor and into the building. <clears throat> and so you get vapor impacts to indoor air. So you see the L's in the blue boxes, the blue houses, as they're under-pressurized homes. One thing we came to realize in the last few years, if, if the building is air-conditioned or the house is air-conditioned, generally you're going to overpressure the bottom floor. That's the H in that middle house. You can actually get indoor air to be forced down downward through the gaps and cracks in the slab and under the, the slabs of the building, eventually negating vapor intrusion into the building. That's something we'd like to look at in more detail in the future. So the evolution of vapor intrusion and chlorinated solvents and pre-1990s wasn't really considered seriously, at least within the states and EPA. In the mid-90s, starting especially in Massachusetts, they uh, highlighted possible vapor intrusion risk, especially from DNAPL and chlorinated solvents. They also looked at petroleum at that time. We'll look at that in a minute. <clears throat> but the, you know, the main risk then was still considered to be from DNAPL right the release area. Around the early 2000s, late 1990s, we started getting more field data for soil gas samples over dissolved phase plumes and realize you could get a vapor intrusion risk. Even then, we were thinking it had to be really high concentration dissolved phase plumes. And that by the mid-2000s, you know, we'd start looking, getting more and more soil gas data all over these dissolved phase plumes. And we'd been publishing the groundwater screening levels when I was with California EPA for vapor intrusion. We realized our screening levels were too high. So between 2000 and 2005, we actually reduced our groundwater screening levels of vapor intrusion by a, about a factor of four, essentially dropping them all down you know, well below PPM level into the hundreds of parts per billion level, just to correspond with what we were seeing in shallow soil gas over these plumes. Now, currently, we're getting a better understanding, I think especially of building leakage and ventilation, and even vapor intrusion, is, it's nothing new. If you look back in the 1940s, there are papers written about uh, indoor air quality, indoor air exchange, and they talk about uh, in one part of building leakage including cracks and gaps in the floor. They suck up fresh air through the slab or under the building from outdoor that leaks in around the slab. So nothing new there. We're also getting a better handle on attenuation factors. And we talked about that in our February presentation, the paper we published. And also coming up next, it's really more interesting, I think now, is looking at spatial and temporal heterogeneity in indoor air samples and soil gas samples and how to, ways to collect more representative samples. That's the wave of the future. We're really looking forward to that. Another thing that really comes out even in EPA's vapor intrusion database is you just don't see that many high-risk vapor intrusion problems. They're, they're pretty rare. If you look at the database in detail, then 75% of the, the indoor air samples they collected, specifically targeted from areas where they're concerned they might have vapor intrusion, were still within anticipated background levels of the, of the VOCs. And even the 25% that were over, a large proportion of those were within an order of magnitude of potential background. So I think our initial idea is still really hold. To get a really high risk vapor intrusion problem, you have to have be sitting right on top of Dean Apple or over a high concentration plume. You'll see impacts over low concentration plumes, but in reality they're not that much higher than ambient levels. They're still important to address. So that's chlorinated solvents. Evolution of vapor intrusion in petroleum again in pre nineteen nineties, I'd say it's not wasn't considered, but it wasn't uncommon. I'm sure there are places where uh, people have built houses on top of gas stations, and the inside of the house started to smell like gasoline. So it was around, but not really looked at in that much detail. Mid 1990s, again, Massachusetts did a lot of work on this and highlighted potential vapor intrusion problems from shallow, less than 15 feet. There's that number again, uh, L and Apple, or free product on groundwater. Definitely, they pointed out it was a lower risk than solvents. It was a 1996 paper published by Massachusetts. <clears throat> also, during that time, a group started up to look at the risk-based evaluation of TPH carbon range, so the TPH fraction of, of uh, petroleum and soil vapors. At that time, it mostly focused on soil, but they were still looking at toxicity of TPH back then. 
early 2000s, it was recognized even in more detail, a lot more data now that natural degradation limits the petroleum vapor transport. And that was you know, widely recognized there. And solvent models don't work. This has really been known for 10 years, and we, we finally have some good guidance out now to discuss in more detail. And really minimal risk from dissolved face plumes. And then current, looking at additional supporting data for the separation distances that the ITRC group and US EPA guidance talks about compared to, to solvents. That looks pretty solid. Uh, also looking in more detail, field space petroleum vapor chemistry, uh, like our office did and some other people looking at, and then we're updating the guidance. That's kind of the quick evolution. So what I'm going to go into now is let's look at some of the petroleum vapor intrusion facts, semi-facts, and fallacies. These are things that our guidance here in Hawaii and some other guidance think everyone agrees on, uh, basically. It's, it's pretty solid, I think. The semi-facts are what most of us agree on there may be some disagreement over the exact numbers and such or specific details, but in general, we agree on these. And then some of the, the fallacies that we've dealt with over the last 20 years, I think we've, we have a pretty good handle on them, but it may not come across in some of the guidance, the other guidance documents uh, as strongly as we put out in our guidance, I mean, in general, just because we have more field data. <clears throat> So looking at, at some facts, things that strong agreement between uh, Hawaii's guidance, US EPA, ITRC guidance documents. And the first is that both chlorinated solvents and petroleum can pose vapor intrusion risk under some circumstances. Uh, the second one, and this is really critical, is the total number of petroleum release sites far outweighs the number of solvent release sites. So especially now as we start looking at petroleum sites in more detail, it's really critical that we get it right. And one thing that's that's critical is that we have a good method set up to screen out very quickly low risk sites. And that's something the ITRC and EPA guidance has been focused on, so that we don't uh, drag small sites that are going to come under a low risk and be and not be considered have a petroleum vapor intrusion risk. We don't want to drag them into the bureaucracy and have them linger for years trying to get an NFA letter or something from the states. So that's a critical thing to screen out these low risk sites. But we, at the same time, we want to be able to flag the high risk sites. The other things everyone agrees on now is petroleum vapors are dominated by aliphatic compounds. We'll look at that in more detail versus uh, BTEX, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, silenes, and naphthalene. And the natural degradation, biodegradation of petroleum vapors significantly reduces potential vapor intrusion risk in comparison to solvents. Also, it's it's well-established facts. The models we've been using for solvents uh, significantly overpredict vapor concentrations away from the source. And it's it's just it's really difficult to predict petroleum migration in the subsurface. We've known that for for 20 years, even with models. In in the end, you you need field data to more accurately assess vapor intrusion risk. So a quick review then the chemistry of liquid fuels versus soil vapors. And here I'm saying soil vapors. It's based mainly on what we see in soil gas data versus what you might see in a lab over free product. So we have gasolines, middle distillates, and heavy oils. Middle distillates is the oil company term for a diesel, stoddard, and jet fuels. So at the bottom here is a the graph at the bottom shows the number of carbon molecules in compounds within those different fuels. So for gasoline, most of the compounds in gasoline, benzene, and such, and plenty of aliphatics are have between 2 and 12 carbons. That's the light end fuels. For our middle distillate fuels, diesel and such, most of the compounds at the light end are missing. We'll look at that in more detail later. Most of the compounds between C5 or 5 carbons and up to 24 carbons. And really the bulk of the fuels we'll look at again later. They mentioned ITRC document is C12 and higher, but there is a lighter fraction. And then the heavy, heavy fuels, motor oil and such, uh, the Compounds are mostly at 20 carbons, very heavy and higher, and they don't really pose a vapor risk. So that the main risk posed by vapor intrusion or the volatile range of compounds is between C2 and really C12. It potentially goes out to C16. The bulk of the compounds we see in the field are between C5 and C12, so between 5 carbons and 12 carbons, kind of between benzene and naphthalene or methylnaphthalene. We'll look at that in a lot more detail. There's some semi-facts. Those are the facts everybody has agree on. Semi-facts, general agreement between our guidance, EPA, and ITRC documents. A little bit uncertainty about some of the details. And the first is for petroleum-free product in the Vado zone on groundwater is required to pose significant PBI risk. 
I know in ITRC's document that in EPA they talk about potential risk from dissolved phase plumes. And we just don't see that in the field here if it's related to a, a fuel, you know, gasoline or diesel or whatever. We mainly focus on free product. And one thing that we have in our guidance is missing in EPA and ITRC guidance is at some point the, the volume of contaminated soil or the area of free product on the groundwater is just too small to pose long term petroleum vapor intru intrusion risk, regardless of the concentrations. The general cutoff, we need to emphasize this more in our guidance, we use around 10 cubic yards for soil. And that's 10 cubic yards of soil, if you release gasoline into it, it'll hold about 25 gallons of gasoline, something like that. So any smaller releases than that, just there's not enough mass to pose long-term vapor intrusion risk. And we put out a number of roughly 100 square feet, that might even be too small for free product on groundwater. Anything smaller than this, you just we don't know of any sites where you're gonna see long-term petroleum vapor intrusion risk from these. You might see some short-term acute level risk, but with, with petroleum, the nice thing is when you're worried about acute exposure, you're going to be able to smell it. So it's, it's less, you'll know when you have a problem and these small sites or small volumes shouldn't pose a long-term problem. This wasn't discussed in those documents, the ITRC, US EPA guidance documents, as I mentioned. We recommend they do, but I think it was just the debate over how you specifically set a number. Another thing, <clears throat> So we all generally agree on vapors are unlikely to exceed potential petroleum vapor intrusion action levels of concern greater than 15 to 30 feet from the source. Our guidance reference is 30 feet. That's some of the original references that they use in ITRC and EPA guidance. ITRC group looked at it in more detail and dropped it down to 15 feet. We, we'll probably do that in our guidance also. I don't know of any sites where we have, we have significant vapor intrusion problems when the source is greater than 15 feet deep. I only know of one, and that was a huge release from a a pipeline. So 15 feet looks good. For now, we have 30 feet in our guidance. So once the source is deeper than this, we don't expect to see significant problems. You can screen those out early on. Lateral separation distance, I think they, in ITRC and EPA documents, they use 100 feet. So vapors could come up, especially under asphalt in the anaerobic zone, and spread laterally. Uh, out there are estimating 100 feet at most above levels of concerns. So that's kind of a general number. We don't have a lot of data, but that seems to match what we see in the field. Let's look at this in a little more detail. These vertical separation distances are really critical for helping us screen out low risk sites. Here's a slide from ITRC guidance for benzene. That describes how they came up with the benzene vertical separation distance of 15 feet. So, and so any contamination below 15 feet, regardless of the concentration, and again, looking at free product, they don't expect to see adverse impacts to indoor air, regardless of what's there. Now, if you look in detail, let's see if this works. At the left side of this graph here is benzene concentration. You may not be able to see it, but it starts off the, the black line there. Uh, the horizontal line is set at 100 micrograms per cubic meter. This is their, the example vapor intrusion subslab soil gas screening level that they were using to set against. So once, once a, let's see, Benzene is below 100 micrograms per cubic meter. They don't, underneath the slab, they don't expect to see impacts to indoor, adverse impacts to indoor air. This assumes a sub-slab attenuation factor of about 300 or 0 0.003. That's, that's a good conservative number for cold climates. So the question was how deep can, can the source be where you would never see vapor, uh, vapor concentration under, under a slab greater than 100 cubic meters or micrograms per cubic meter? And here's the graph shows the, the data that they collected on the bottom of the graph is the distance to the source. And right around 15 feet, you see my cursor going that black line, they don't see any, they don't have any data where the, the concentration of benzene and soil gas was greater than 100 micrograms per cubic meter, 15 feet from the source. So this looks pretty solid at first. You know, there's no indication that benzene is gonna, more than 15 feet away from a source, is gonna be greater than 100 micrograms per cubic meter. But look at this graph again in more detail at the 15 foot line. And one thing that stands out is they have you know, virtually no data past 15 feet, just a very small amount of data. So that's the question comes up using a benzene vertical separation distance, 15 feet. You know, the problem is there's minimal data points beyond 15 feet. So how can you conclude that benzene vapors won't exceed 100 micrograms per cubic meter greater than 15 feet from the source if you don't have any field data to do that? But it, uh, they actually, this isn't, doesn't come necessarily very clearly in ITRC guidance document at, at first, but if you look in detail, 
what they did is they looked at trends where they do have data from zero to 15 feet. And based on the trends that they're seeing there, then by the time you get to 15 feet, they don't anticipate away from a source, then it's reasonable to anticipate you're not going to see benzene and uh, soil gas greater than 100 micrograms per cubic meter. So even though they don't have much data, they have good, uh, pretty good handle on trends zero to 15 feet to make that call and make a call of 15 foot separation distance. And with, that's, that seems to match what we see here in the field. There's some additional PBI considerations based on the sort of facts and semi-facts, things that most people agree on. For one thing, you get much smaller uh, vapor plumes associated with petroleum than you do with chlorinated solvents. The primary risk, again, is from shallow free product, where you're sitting right on top of shallow free product, and especially you, uh, when you could potentially generate an anaerobic zone uh, between the source area and the, the bottom of the structure you're talking about, say in paved areas or under a building slab. Our current DOH vertical separation distance for petroleum vapor intrusion in general, in our guidance, we state 30 feet. And ITRC is stating they, they can make a good call for 15 feet. And the way we put it in our discussion is we don't have any data to dispute that 15 feet is a reasonable vertical separation distance. So below that depth, you, won't, you don't expect to see a significant vapor intrusion from petroleum. So if anyone knows of any data, where that's not the case, then let me know. Let's look at some of the, the fallacies. And again, these are myths I had for myself. And that, you know, the saying, good experience comes from bad experiences. And after 20 years, I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of these. So they're the great times to, to learn. The uh, first thing is diesel fuel is not volatile and does not pose a potential vapor intrusion risk. Well, here's a kind of a hint to self. If you can smell it, then it's volatile. We learned that the hard way a couple of years ago here in Hawaii, and I'll show you that. An example of that. Second fallacy that we had, and uh, it still comes out some today, is that risk based indoor air and soil gas screening levels or action levels can't be developed for the non BTEX TPH component of vapors. Well, we've been actually doing that for, for 20 years. And the office I worked in in California published risk based numbers for TPH and soil gas and indoor air, I think, the first time in almost 15 years ago now. So, the third fallacy that, that we need to deal with benzene or other individual aromatics always drive petroleum vapor intrusion risk over TPH. So even if the TPH is there, even if you can develop risk-based screening levels, benzene is still the problem. And again, we'll talk about that. And that's true in some cases, and it's not true in others. And then the fourth fallacy we look at is TPH compounds in, in the vapors, especially the aliphatics. Okay, they're there, and in the source area, they could potentially drive risk over benzene because there's so much of it compared to benzene, but they're not going to migrate more than two or three feet from the source above potential levels of concern for vapor intrusion. Compared, that's essentially stating that was a vertical separation distance versus 15 feet for benzene. And again, that doesn't hold up in the field when you start actually looking at field data, so we'll look at that. So again, fallacy number one, diesel fuel is not volatile. So we learned this the hard way. This is actually a photograph from a site we worked on about 10 years ago, just up the street from our office. It was in a diesel tank. Uh, they knew it had been leaking, and the site was about to get redeveloped. This stuff had been sitting in the ground. You can see it's about 10 or 15 feet below ground surface. It had been sitting there for 20 years. So this is some really degraded diesel fuel. We weren't that concerned about it. We knew they were digging the tank up. It's a densely developed area. But it's diesel fuel. It's not going to be too many vapor problems. We mentioned it to the consultant. If there are any vapor problems, you need to address it. Well, once they started getting down near the ground mortar, the, the vapors coming out of the pit were so strong, they actually uh, went up, a vapor plume went up in the air. It was the first case of vapor intrusion that we know of. In an odd way, the vapors coming out the pit went up in the air, got blown across the street and sucked into an HVAC system across the, the street in a, a building. And I think it was actually a state building. The vapors inside the building were so strong, they had to evacuate the building. And we had to get uh, some people out there to put some vapor suppressants on the pit while they finished excavating it. So there's a, there's a good experience from a bad experience. So one, one issue we have, and one thing it, you can see in the EPA and ITRC guidance, is that this potential problem isn't really flagged, although the EPA guidance that just came out in June does include diesel and other middle disks with jet fuels of potential vapor intrusion concerns. And the slightly older ITRC guidance, if it, depending on how you read it, it can imply that you don't need to worry about vapor intrusion problems from diesel because it's not significantly volatile. And we'll look at that in a little more detail. So what, what we did, we always wondered what we were smelling at these diesel sites. So we, again, used our grant money 
several years ago and went out and collect, started collecting soil gas samples at sites to see exactly what these diesel sites and jet fuel sites, what the vapors were made of. We focused on jet fuels and diesel. There's already some data out, including EPA's TPI database for gasoline sites. We wanted to supplement that by looking, doing a more detailed review of the chemistry of vapors coming from a diesel and jet fuel. We also reviewed other published databases, again, the PPI database EPA did. And then we, the results of this study are discussed in Appendix C of the ITRC PPI guidance. And you see below are some of the references for the reports we did. So we published a, a technical study report with all the data, and then we wrote a paper on it in 2013 and published it. So at each site, we went out and collected the soil gas samples multiple times at, at five different sites in Hawaii. And again, mostly middle distillates. We couldn't actually find any good gasoline sites to, uh, to collect soil gas samples. We collected samples using suma canisters and sorbent tubes. We did this because the suma canisters can only you can only report uh, aliphatic and or aliphatic aromatic compounds at about C12. Beyond that, they can't extract them from the, the canisters. So we also collected sorbent tube soil gas samples so we could look and see what was in the C12 to C18, roughly the heavier volatile chemicals in the vapor plumes. And some of the studies been published at the time suggested that even with diesel fuel, it could be dominated by these heavier compounds, C12 and higher. Most of the samples we collected were 5 to 15 feet plus from the source. So keep that in mind. We'll talk about that again later. And look at some of the concentrations we were finding 5 to 15 feet from the source. Each sample, we tested a, a soil gas samples for TPH, TPH carbon ranges using multiple different types of analytical methods. Also, we tested for BTEX plus naphthalene. We'll talk it again, about it again later. We calculated weighted TPH toxicity factors for each one of the, the samples and for the sites in general. We also looked at the ratio of the TPH to benzene. We'll talk about this also. At, at some point, that ratio gets so high and TPH is so overwhelming that you know, TPH could drive risk over benzene. So we'll look at that in more detail. Here's what we found at the site. And the first, here's the first line, the US EPA database uh, PPI. Again, this is mostly gasoline sites, intentionally targeted gasoline sites. But, but TPH in the vapor is greater than 95% uh, of the vapor concentration is made up of TPH. That's not a big surprise. And your BTEX less than 5%. It's just an estimate because they didn't have data for all the sites. But again, no big surprise. Here's the key thing to think about, that the ratio of TPH to benzene and the these vapor samples from the database are about 300 to 1. So 300 times as much benzene, or TPH, excuse me, compared to benzene on average in the samples. That was actually the median. The average was a lot higher than this because some of their samples had you know, very high TPH levels in the millions of micrograms per cubic meters and no benzene. We'll look at that again later. So this is the median value we used. Site A, and from our study, was mostly avgas or aviation gasoline. Again, 99.6%. TPH in the vapor is very little BTEX. TPH to benzene ratio of 1,500 to 1. So there's even less benzene in the, the vapors at this site. Site D is mostly JP4. I have to wonder if it wasn't some JPA because this site looked like it had a little bit of kerosene in it. This is a mixture of gasoline and kerosene. Think of it that way. Again, 99, 98% TPH. One, a little bit over 1%, 1, 2% BTEX, so it's mostly xylenes. But look at the TPH to benzene ratio, 9,000 to 1. So it's even less benzene in the vapors at this site. This site, it, again, if you go out in the field, this site reeked. There was no question it was a vapor intrusion problem. And they just spent quite a bit of money cleaning it up. It's a site at Pearl Harbor. Site E, this was a diesel release, 99.9% .9 TPH. Not a big surprise, very little BTEX and even naphthalene in the vapors at this site and look at the average TPH to benzene ratio over the multiple times we sampled here, 19,000 to one. Not a big surprise. The vapors there, again, they're very strong in the field. This is what was coming out of that pit that we just talked about earlier. It's all TPH. If you look at it, look at it in a minute, it's, it's all TPH aliphatics, mostly C9, C12. So that's what we found in our study is a quick look at the one of the gas chromatographs for the desoil vapors, again, soil vapors study site E that we looked at here in Hawaii. And you can see over on the, the right-hand side, most of the compounds fall between C9 and C12, C9 and C13. That makes up the bulk of the, the vapors that we're seeing. But you still get you know, a fair amount of C5 to C8 uh, 
compounds within the vapors, but mostly C9 to C12. And some of the sites before I forget to mention, even when we think it's diesel or jet fuels, this can be reversed. The bulk of the vapors could be made up of C5 to C8 compounds, but with still a decent component of C9 to C12. So really, when uh, if you're going to go out and collect soil gas samples at a diesel or jet fuel site, whatever, you want the lab to report TPH as the sum of C5 to C12. You don't want to ask them to report just these TPH is diesel because they'll just they'll start at C10 like they do for soil, and they don't miss everything less than C10 in the vapor, so you could actually miss most of the TPH in that sample. So if that's one thing, remember, especially locally, TPH, soil gas, acid lab, sum of C5 to C12, not TPH diesel. Here's the carbon range makeup uh, for the diesel site we talked about, the average. And so about 74% C9 to C12 aliphatics, 25% C5 to C8 aliphatics. And just a trace amount of the C9 to C10 aromatics, not really too significant. Just to keep in mind, the average TPH in the soil gas here, sum of C5 to C12, close to 3 million micrograms per cubic meter. That's pretty high. You can start smelling you know, diesel at a couple of thousand micrograms per cubic meter. Again, this site reeked. And again, these were, you know, say, 5 to 10 feet from the source. And naphthalene in these samples was non-detect to less than 200 micrograms per cubic meter. So we, we didn't see that much naphthalene in any of the slides we looked at. So that's a, a key point here is even with diesel fuel, it's the graph from ITRC for liquid fuels. If you look at the black line here, it shows the composition of diesel fuel. Most of the compounds in diesel fuel are greater than C12, the black line here. But once you get into the, the volatile range of compounds, C5 to C12, if, if you look at just this graph, it looks like diesel is insignificant, and there's very little you know, volatile com components within diesel fuel. Even though it's a small amount, though, this is what comes out of the release. This is what we're smelling in the field. It could pose potential PVI problems. It's a smaller volume, a smaller component of the diesel fuel, but still could pose uh, potential vapor intrusion problems. One thing is you'll get much lower concentrations over diesel-free product of TPH and other compounds than you would over gasoline, which have a much higher fraction of these volatile components. And let's see if I missed anything here. I think we already covered all these. So for, for diesel fuel, it looks a little bit different, the chemistry of liquid fuels versus vapors. Again, diesel fuel, it does have a small component, C5 to C12. And the diesel vapors we've seen in the field, the, the center of the main mass of, of uh, vapors of TPH compounds tends to fall close to C9 to C12, where for gasoline, the, the main mass of compounds would be lighter than that, so between C5 and, and C8. And in theory, you could see it, uh, some compounds greater than C12, and some of the papers we looked at say they could dominate. We never saw that in the field. With our sorbent tube samples, we never found anything greater than C12, that, making up more than 10% of the, the total TPH in the vapors. So we'll probably take the sorbent tube recommendation out of our guidance uh, sometime in the near future. Now we have enough data to say it's just not necessary. And let me know if anyone has any examples where that's not true, where they do see a high greater than 10% of the vapors with TPH greater than C12. So summary for diesel, diesel is volatile. You can get significant vapors. Again, you need to be right on top of the free products dominated in our studies by C9, C12. You get lower concentrations in the vapor plumes compared to gasoline, but still could pose potential PVI risk from shallow, we'd say less than 15 feet free product. Naphthalene was typically ND or very low, not a risk driver to any of the sites we looked at. Now here's the PID factoid, another good experience from bad experiences. At our diesel sites, you could smell the vapors coming out of the vapor points, but our PID was getting no response, or like one ppm or something, which was really odd until someone pointed out the PIDs mostly respond to aromatics, not aliphatics. So when you're out in the field, a PID doesn't really work at a, a diesel site where the, the, the vapors are composed of aliphatics. You're going to get much lower readings or something, but it's not your PID. It's just basic chemistry. Okay, quick, let's move on to fallacy number two then. So we know that TPH makes up the bulk of vapors at both gasoline and, and diesel sites. We'll look at that in more detail, but this is sort of a fallacy that we had in the past. TPH action levels can't be developed for vapor intrusion or for indoor air and soil gas. 
Well, actually, that's, we've had inhalation-based toxicity factors for the TPH carbon ranges since the early 1990s. This is there's a group called the Total Petroleum Hydrocarbon Criteria Working Group that was put together in the mid-90s to look at the toxicity of the TPH fraction of petroleum compounds. And at the time, it was more focused on you know, how to deal with contaminated soil that's being left in place, but they also published inhalation toxicity factors for different carbon ranges, which allows you to calculate indoor air action levels as well as soil gas action levels, paper intrusion. You know, Massachusetts published their own toxicity factors for TPH in 1997. They've been updating them since. The U.S. The Department of Human Health Services published toxicity factors in 1999. For carbon ranges, DOE from Washington published factors in 2006. California published some toxicity factors in 2009. Those were since been retracted, and they're looking at those and updating them with additional information now. But then US EPA also published toxicity factors for TPH carbon ranges in 2009. And just last year, I believe the EPA started including regional screening levels for TPH carbon ranges in their RSL guidance. And several other states have been publishing risk-based screening levels for TPH uh, you know, for 15 years, mostly for soil again. As far as I know, only California, that's the San Francisco Bay Area Regional Water Board and, and our office, Hawaii, have actually published TPH screening levels for indoor air and soil gas. If that's not true, let me know if anyone else knows of any screening levels out there. So that here's just a summary of the EPA inhalation toxicity factors for vapor phase carbon ranges. So uh, vapors, petroleum vapors can be uh, divided into aromatics and aliphatics, you know, light, light, rend, light range, and then uh, heavier range compounds. But their toxicity factor for inhalation for the lighter compound, C5 to C8, is it's called a reference concentration is 600 micrograms per cubic meter. So what this means is that you could be exposed to C5 to C8 aliphatics inside indoor air at 600 micrograms per cubic meter every second of the day for years and years, and there would be no adverse health effects. The, the heavier compounds, both the aromatics and the aliphatics, C9, C16, or C18, are based on the toxicity studies, are actually more toxic. And the reference concentration for these is only 100 micrograms per, per cubic meter, so six times lower than the lighter end aliphatics or six times more toxic. I hate using the word toxic, actually. It doesn't mean it's necessarily a problem. This is still pretty high for compounds in general. Just put this in perspective, the benzene reference, benzene's indoor air action level is 0.31. So we have toxicity factors for the different carbon ranges. And when you have toxicity factors, you can calculate indoor air goals. And if you have an indoor air goal, then you can use the subslab attenuation factor and calculate a subslab soil gas action level or screening level. So for C5 to C8 aliphatics, in our guidance, we use EPA's reference concentration, 600 micrograms per cubic meter. Indoor air goal, we adjust that for how many days per year someone's exposed and such. You get an indoor air goal a little bit higher, 630 micrograms per cubic meter. And then we multiply that by 1,000 in Hawaii for a subslab attenuation factor. So we get a subslab soil gas action level of 630,000 micrograms per cubic meter. What this means is if you have 630,000 micrograms per cubic meter soil gas, or TPH in the soil gas under the slab, C5, C8 aliphatics, it's going to get diluted by a factor of 1,000 by the time it mixes with indoor air. C9, C18 aliphatics, and C9 to C16 aromatics, same reference concentration, same indoor air concentration, didn't really change 100 micrograms per cubic meter. And again, there's our sub-slab soil gas action levels for TPH, these higher range aliphatics and aromatics. 100, 100,000 micrograms per cubic meter. So that's pretty high, but you know, I'll show you some data. We, we definitely see a higher concentration set in the soil. So what you can do with this, it's, it's expensive to get the carbon range data on side-by-side -side basis. Not that many labs do it all, but you can, if you get the carbon range data for your petroleum, you can calculate a weighted indoor air and soil gas TPH action level. And we discussed this in the paper we published in 2013, where you, it reduces the need for site-specific carbon range data, and you can just get standard TPH soil vapor data and use calculate a site-specific screening level. Just for TPH, use that to screen your site, or you can use default carbon range makeup for, to develop generic screening levels, which we did in our office. So in this example here, it's 63% C5, C8 aliphatics, 33% C9, C12 aliphatics, and just a little bit of 
C9 to C10 aromatics. So we have toxicity factors for each one of these. If this was the component of the vapors, we can calculate a weighted uh, toxicity factor, and hence the uh, indoor air action level and then the soil gas action level. Let's look at some of these. Here's the Avgas aviation gasoline site. It's the gas chromatograph for the, on average, typical one for the samples we collected at this site. You can see here, if you remember the diesel site, most of the vapors were C9, C13. Gasoline, everything is shifted to the left. It's lighter in compounds. Most of the compounds here look like they're you know, C6 to C8 in that area. Here's a pie chart of what the, the vapors here look like. 96.5% of the vapors at this Avgas site for, for TPH were made up of C5 to C8 aliphatics. Not a big surprise, Ian. 3% C9 to C12 aliphatics. You do pick up a little bit of the heavier and stuff. Very little C9 to C10 aromatics. So if this is our site, say a representative sample from the site, we can calculate a weighted reference concentration from this. Now, that's actually not straightforward. Check out the, the equation in our paper. But the weighted reference concentration, 510 micrograms per cubic meter. We can calculate indoor air action level for this site based on this, 530 micrograms per cubic meter. There's our soil gas action level times 1,000, 530,000 micrograms per cubic meter. So real simple to calculate risk-based action levels weighted for TPH. Here's something this site. Look at the average TPH to benzene ratio, 1,500 to 1 again. Very little benzene in the vapors at this site. But again, this site was very stinky. Here's the average carbon range makeup of gasoline vapors from data that's included in the US EPA PBI database. Uh, something to look at here is the higher proportion of C9 to C12 aliphatics than we've seen at other gasoline sites. At least the data we had access to, 15% seems kind of high for gasoline, 7% C9 to C10 aromatics and 77% C5 to C8 aliphatics. And this is the average of 35 samples from 10 of the 48 sites included in US EPA PBI database. Now, originally, we thought that there might be some diesel vapors or some kerosene vapors, heating fuel tanks or something included, or mixed in with the gasoline vapors at this site. Still not certain about that. You'll see later on, we have another gasoline site, this time from California, but where it had a similar relatively high proportion of C9 to C12 aliphatics. And that site we definitely know is, is gasoline only. It's a low benzene gasoline. So anyway, for this, just assuming these numbers are right, using this for the average for the PBI database, we calculate a weighted reference concentration of 275 micrograms per cubic meter. So that's a little low for gasoline vapors in general from what we anticipated, which means it's a little more toxic than we anticipated. Uh, correlative indoor air, Action level, 290 micrograms per cubic meter, times 1,000 for use in Hawaii anyway. Soil gas action level of 290,000 micrograms per cubic meter. And then look at this, the, the median TPH to benzene ratio from the data, this is from hundreds of samples in the EPA's PBI database, was 300 to 1. This is actually pretty low. There's, there is quite a bit of benzene in these samples, which tends to verify that it is gasoline. So keep these numbers in mind and we're going to look at them later on. Chromatics. Here's a, here's a gas chromatograph. In the, uh, that was gasoline. This is a JP4. We're getting more heavier end compounds in the vapors, our study site D. You can see that the main mass of vapors here is shifted over to the right. And you're starting to pick up some heavier compounds, C9 to C13. Let's see if this worked. Okay, this one worked. Here's the pie chart that shows the the distribution of aliphatics and aromatics at the site, 63% C5 to C8 aliphatics. We're getting a larger component now, C9 to C12 aliphatics, 33%. And we're picking up some heavier aromatics, 4%. So with these, we have a higher concentration of the more toxic, uh, uh, heavier aliphatics and aromatics. Now our weighted reference concentration goes down, which means it's getting more toxics. So it, now it's 211 micrograms per cubic meter. Into air screening level based on that reference concentration, 220 micrograms per cubic meter. Soil gas action level, 220,000 micrograms per cubic meter. Average benzene at TPH, 9,100 to one. So very little benzene. Here's the diesel side again. We already looked at this graph, mostly the heavier aliphatics. This is what we saw here, 75% roughly. C9 to C12 aliphatics, 25%. C5, C8 aliphatics, very little of the aromatics. 
Weighted reference concentration for this site, 127 micrograms per cubic meter. Indoor action level, 130 micrograms per cubic meter. Soil gas action level, times 1,000. Look at this, the average TPH to benzene, 54,000 to 1. So almost no benzene here, even though you have very high concentrations of TPH in the soil gas. So here's what we did for our guidance. Uh, we opted to go with some uh, data published in the BioVapor, it's a model uh, document. For gasoline, we're assuming, for gasoline vapors, we're assuming that it's made up of 99% C5 to C8 aliphatics and very little of the heavier end compounds. So we get a weighted reference concentration, 571 micrograms per cubic meter. That's about as least toxic you can get. And you see our indoor air and soil gas screening levels. That's where those come from. So again, gasoline vapors are dominated by these lower toxicity C5 C8 aliphatics, at least as our default, and just minor concentration above. Now, one thing here, let's jump back to diesel. Let's see, XL is our gasoline. The gasoline odor recognition threshold is somewhere between 750, 4,000 micrograms per cubic meter. Our indoor air action level is 600 micrograms per cubic meter. So really with gasoline, you're, once it starts to get a, in a high risk zone where there's, there's definitely a problem, you're probably going to be able to smell it. That's an important thing to think about for gasoline sites. You're, not gonna, you're probably not going to have a problem, vapor intrusion problem, and not know it at these sites. Here's our default action levels for diesel vapors. Uh, again, we based on 75%. C9 to C12 aliphatics, 25%. Uh, C5 to C8 aliphatics, so a significant contribution of these higher range uh, and more toxic aliphatic compounds. The weighted reference concentration goes way down to 126, and then we have sub subsequently lower indoor air and soil gas action levels, 130, 130,000. Again, dominated by C9, C12 aliphatics. And this, what we, this is actually what we use as a default in our vapor intrusion guidance. If you go to our screening levels, our action levels, and pull up TPH, then you'll see the same action levels for both TPH as gasoline, or from gasoline and from diesel releases, 130 micrograms per cubic meter and 130,000 micrograms per cubic meter. This is because at most of the sites we looked at, even the word gasoline, uh, a lot of the sites anyway we look at, it seems to be a mix of gasoline and diesel vapors at these sites. So we want our screening levels are intentionally conservative at these sites, assuming up front there could be some diesel vapors at it and you need lower action levels. Here's something to think about here. The indoor action level for diesel is 130, or TPH, 130 micrograms per cubic meter for diesel vapors. Diesel rec odor recognition threshold somewhere in several thousand micrograms per cubic meter. That's an issue with diesel vapors. Unlike gasoline, you, in theory, you could have a, a potentially significant impact in indoor air and you wouldn't be able to smell it or even know it. And this is all centers on the toxicity factors used for these heavier end aliphatics. So here's our action levels. Again, this is how it works. It's for TPH, you just can see one action level. Our indoor action level, we settled on 130 micrograms per cubic meter. Subsap soil gas, 130,000 micrograms per cubic meter. So if you have less than this in the TPH under a slab or near a slab, you shouldn't have a TPI problem. And then we focus on the presence of groundwater, or free product on groundwater within 15 feet. And we say 30 feet now, 15 feet is probably good for potential uh, vapor intrusion concerns. And we have action levels for individual compounds like benzene. Like for groundwater, it's 1,900 micrograms per cubic meter. This actually includes a tenfold vapor biodegradation factor. So as benzene vapors come out of groundwater, migrate up 15 feet to beneath the slab, we assume it at minimum a tenfold degradation. That you know, that may not be, that may be overly conservative at some sites. Uh, we recommend getting soil gas data instead of relying on the groundwater data. At sites, we have free product within 15 feet of a building, the uh, first floor of a building. Okay, that's, that was a lot on the action levels. Fallacy number three that we had to get over, just check the benzene. I always show this slide. This is one of my last consulting jobs. I won't say where, but this site had a risk assessment done, and it passed. It's focused on benzene, and then the site caught on fire when they were excavating it to put in an underground parking garage. And that was mainly because of the, the gasoline vapors that you could smell in the field. This threw up a big warning flag just because the site is okay for benzene, doesn't matter. I mean, it's okay for TPH. This is all based on soil and groundwater data, actually, at the risk assessment. We didn't have any vapor data at the time, but it definitely threw up a something to think about. So this, there's no specific discussion of PBI risk drivers in either the EPA or the ITRC guidance document. It's something we pushed to get in, but didn't make it. You know, the main focus in the examples you'll see if you sit down in their workshops and their classroom training is on benzene. That doesn't imply that TPH can be ignored. 
So let's look at this. How do you determine the risk driver for a site? And by risk driver, we mean there's, there's no significant risk from other chemicals when the risk posed by this one chemical is addressed. So one way to think of this, I think if you had a site contaminated with lead, high concentrations of lead and low concentrations of dioxins, that's actually common for some of the fill material here in Hawaii. It's got lead from incinerator ash. But dioxins, in theory, are more toxic. But because the, of the, just the ratio of lead to dioxins, the, the lead risk posed by the lead, it far overwhelms the risk posed by dioxins. So if you clean up a site to meet your lead action levels, you're also going to address any remaining any risk posed by dioxins. So by this, we mean the, the lead is the risk driver. And if you just cleaned up a site to meet dioxin action levels and you ignored the lead, then you could still leave contamination in place from the lead that posed a risk. So you really, you have to look at both. So that was the question that came up here. Was We started looking at several years ago, was could TPH in vapors still pose a potential vapor intrusion risk, even though the benzene action level and subslab soil gas is, or is, are met either or in indoor air? So could TPH drive risk over benzene? And it's actually pretty easy to think about it. At some ratio of TPH to benzene, then the TPH is going to become the main risk driver. Uh, to calculate this in our paper, we call it the critical threshold uh, ratio. And this is simply the, the, the TPH action level divided by the benzene action level. So this ratio, once you exceed that in your field data, then TPH could potentially pose a PVI risk even though benzene action levels are met. So for example, if you look at our action levels for indoor air soil gas, same thing. Just take the ratio of TPH to benzene, it's about 420 to 1. So in our guidance, if you're in the field and you're collecting soil gas samples just with TPH and benzene, once you see that ratio start to peak over 420 to 1, you need to start thinking that TPH could be the main risk driver of this site, even if benzene action levels are met. This is based on, it has a quotient of 1 for TPH, I failed to mention that before. It's also, we're looking at benzene action levels based on 10 to the minus excess cancer risk. Now, if we assume that to the minus five excess cancer risk for benzene, our action level would be, for indoor air, would be 3.1 instead of 0.31, and subslab soil gas would be 31 instead of 310, and then that critical ratio drops down to 442 instead of 420. So it becomes even more important to look at TPH. So here's some examples. Here's the Avgas site. Here, the, this critical TPH benzene ratio based on the site specific action level, the weighted action level we calculated for TPH divided by 0.31 of the benzene action level, or 310 for soil gas, is 1,700 to 1. So in this case, TPH becomes the risk driver when the ratio of TPH to benzene in the field starts to exceed 1,700. Well, at this site, they're actually pretty even, 1,500 to 1. So benzene at this Avgas site, like you think of for a lot of gasoline sites, actually does drive risk as long as you're using this 10 to minus 6 target risk level. What this means, if you reduce say, benzene vapors and soil gas down to this action level 310 micrograms per cubic meter, then you should also be, re you're going to reduce TPH down below its action level 530 micrograms per cubic meter. So we, we took the same approach and looked at the EPA's database, mainly for gasoline sites. Here's the critical ratio for that site. Just an example, on average, we calculated a uh, sub-slab soil gas action level of 230 micrograms per cubic meter. I'm a, sorry, an indoor air action level of 230 micro, 290 micrograms per cubic meter based on their TPH carbon range data. And then using a benzene action level of 0.31 micrograms per cubic meter, we get a critical ratio of about 900 to 1. Same time TPH starts to exceed 900 to 1, the ratio to benzene to TPH could drive risk. But that was pretty good news. The, the median measured TPH to benzene ratio on the EPA's PPI database was 300 to 1. So on average, on median, most of the sites, the, the ratio was, there was a lot of benzene in the soil gas, and actually benzene was the, the risk driver for vapor intrusion. Uh, one problem issue, though, is 33% of the samples in EPA's database, the, at, the, at the bottom of the graph, the TPH to benzene ratio was greater than 900 to 1. So what this suggests is that for 33% of the samples there, TPH would drive risk over benzene. That's a third of the sites. It's still significant. Uh, portion. If you drop down to a 10 to the minus 5 target risk for benzene, your indoor air goal instead of 0.31 would bump up to 3.1. This critical ratio then would be 90 to 1. 
So once the ratio of TPH to benzene exceeds 90 to 1, then TPH could be the risk driver. And if that would actually incorporate another 46% of the samples included in the TBI database. So you could have up to 79% of the samples in the database. And using those as an example, TPH would be the risk driver if you used a 10 to the minus fifth target risk for benzene. Something important to think about. In the end, you just need to look at both. Here's a gasoline example site uh, from California. It has a lot of good information in it. Carbon range makeup, 80%, C5, C8. Aliphatics, 25% or 20%, C9 to C12 aliphatics. The TPH RFC, 308 micrograms per cubic meter. Toxicity factor. So we get an indoor air screening level about 320 micrograms per cubic meter. Then this ratio of TPH to benzene, about 1,000 to 1. So once you start seeing a TPH ratio of, of greater than 1,000 to 1, the TPH to benzene is site, then you know TPH is going to be an important risk driver. If you look at data for this site, in this cross section, at the source, TPH was screaming high, 310 million micrograms per cubic meter, benzene much lower. TPH to benzene ratio is 4,000 to 1, so very little benzene at the site. This was pretty definitely a release of more recent low benzene gasoline. So even at the source, TPH is driving risk. If you go up higher above the source, about five feet over the source now, look how high the TPH still is. Keep this in mind, 99 million micrograms per cubic meter. TPH to benzene ratio, benzene was even non-detect, 13,000 to one. Keep this in mind, the, the ratio of TPH to benzene seems to be going up as you go away from the source. It somehow you seem to be depleting the vapors from benzene. So at this side, again, TPH drives risk. If you, if you manage to remediate the side down to the benzene action level for soil gas, then TPH would still be four to 13 times above its action levels of uh, potential vapor intrusion concern. This is a JP4 site we looked at. We see the same thing once you start looking at the middle distance. Once you drop your benzene down to a 10 to the minus six uh, target risk, your TPH in the vapors could still be well above their uh, target action level for soil gas. In this case, 13 times above its action level, even though benzene, in theory, would meet its uh, target risk level for vapor intrusion. So clearly, TPH drives risk at this JP4 site, middle distance. Here's a diesel site. It's even worse. I, you could think it. There's very little benzene in the soil gas and the vapors coming off of this plume. So the, the average TPH benzene ratio of the site was actually 54,001. So very clearly here, you can't just look at benzene. Even though benzene doesn't pose a risk, the TPH could pose a risk. So I just in summary with that, that a past fallacy, I think that for gasolines, it is true in most, in most cases, the sites we looked at, benzene drives risk. Some proportion of sites, especially these newer gasolines or low benzene gasolines, TPH is going to drive risk over benzene. The middle distillate sites we looked at, Avgas, JP4, diesel, for Avgas, it's, it's pretty even. TPH and benzene pose equal risk, vapor intrusion standpoint. And again, this is assuming the vapors actually make it up to the slough of the building and pull it inside. Uh, JP4 diesel, very clearly a, a diesel TPH drives risk over benzene. And again, we didn't see much naphthalene in these sites. It's not really a risk driver in sites we looked at. Okay, but finishing up the last fallacy that TPH vapors, vapors are gone very quickly is something we thought also. But, and this, this still, the hypothesis that uh, aliphatics get very quickly removed from the vapor plume as the vapors migrate away from the source area, just from a higher relative degradation rate compared to ar aromatics. This is some lab studies that this idea came out in. So that even if the TPH is high in the, the vapor, in the source area, you have a very high ratio of TPH to benzene. By the time the vapors get to a building, most of the aliphatics are gone, and you're ended up with a benzene or BTEX enriched plume. Well, this is real easy to test in the field. And this information really isn't in either IRT, ITRC or EPA, PVI got its documents, but it's used in the references. And what they did is they assumed a TPH subslab vapor intrusion screening level of uh, 20,000 micrograms per cubic meter. So the, the, the idea is that once you get more than two to three feet away from a source area, you're never going to see TPH and soil gas above this, this level, 20,000 micrograms per cubic meter. But it's actually based on very limited field data. And th there are some models that predict a that this would happen, but they're based on a higher relative degradation rate for aliphatics versus aromatics. The aliphatics, again, are going to be quickly go away based on this, the models that's included in the biovapor model. What this does, it predicts, it predicts relative enrichment of vapors in BTEX away from the source area. 
So your TPH to benzene ratio would decrease as the aliphatics are, are taken out of the vapors as they migrate away from the source area. But this, we just don't see this in the field. In the two to three foot separation distance, even for 20,000 micrograms per cubic meter, we don't see that in the field justified either. We talk to people who do a lot of soil gas sampling and they'll, I expect they'll say the same thing, Stephanie, once we talk to. And again, the VTEX enriched vapor plumes that are predicted by the biovapor models and other laboratory-based modeling, we just, we don't see that in the field. If anything, we see the opposite. And this first, a quick look at this two to three foot separation distance, where it did come from, or at least from field data. Here's the field data that's not presented, but referenced in the ITRC and EPA guidance document. And again, here's the graph on the left. We have a concentration of C9, C12 aliphatics or C5, C8 aliphatics. Just think of this TPH. Here's the this 20,000 micrograms per cubic meter screening level they were using for vapor intrusion. Think of this as sub-slab soil gas screening level. <clears throat> And then here's this two to three foot line that they draw through it, where to the right of this line, to, to the right of two to three foot separation distance, they don't have any data that suggests you're going to get over 20,000 micrograms per cubic meter TPH and soil gas this far from the source. But again, look, there's, they have very little data here to support this. And they, they mentioned that in the report. But this still could come across in some of the webinars and workshops. It's important to think about. They, they just don't have the data to, to justify this. <clears throat> And, the, you know, the models, you can model this, and the models may say the same thing. <clears throat> and models are a great learning tool, and they're very useful predicting a, for setting up remedial actions and long-term management plans. But as someone told me a long time ago, models tell you exactly what you tell them to tell you. They don't really predict anything. They tell you what you tell them to tell you. And we see a lot of significant variability with insights as far as degradation away from source areas and TPH and benzene concentrations and soil gas. So these models can be... It can be very useful, but highly inaccurate in the field. And you always want to confirm any DVI models with actual field data. <clears throat> Here's some field data, again, from this California site. Yeah, so if we look at this, just see, getting down, if we look at the source area here, you can calculate an a action level for this site. I think they, well, let's just use the 20,000 micrograms per cubic meter screening level that they use in the background for the ITRC documents of the PVI database. Well, here we are right at the source area, TPH gasoline, 310 million micrograms per cubic meter, very hot. Here we are five feet above the source area, TPH gasoline, 99,000 micrograms per cubic meter. So very clearly, you can get very high concentrations of TPH greater than two to three feet from the source area. And in general, we feel at the 15-foot separation distance, it still works well enough for TPH. The two to three foot separation distance definitely isn't protective enough. Also here, the models will predict you, that you'd see a relative enrichment of, uh, I got this backwards, you see a relative enrichment of benzene with respect to TPH with distance from the source. So that's wrong right there. And you, we actually see the opposite in the field. TPH to benzene ratio at this site, 4,000 to 1 at the source in the vapors. Five feet away, TPH to benzene ratio greater than 13,000 to 1. This is only one site. We only have this little bit of data, but... We seem to see that in the data we looked at is you actually are you're losing aromatics in the vapor plume as the vapors migrate away from the source, exactly the opposite of what the laboratory studies and the models would predict. So where's the benzene? As, you know, one idea is you could be having preferential degradation of aromatics relative to aliphatics you know, in the vapor plumes. That's inconsistent with laboratory studies. You, you could see uh, preferential removal of aromatics from vapors due to partitioning of the aromatics in the soil moisture because they're much higher solubility. That's pretty likely to be happening some of these. Another possibility is you've had an original release of low benzene gasoline to start with. Most likely, and we think it's in the sites we look at, it's most likely the latter. Is when you see these very high TPH to benzene ratios at site, it was probably a release of low benzene gasoline to start with. You might be getting some removal of aromatics from the vapors as the vapors migrate away from the source, but we just don't see a consistent trend. We don't have the data to see a consistent trend in, alif in a aromatic enrichment away from the sources or in aliphatic enrichment as the aromatics are removed from the vapors. That's something we can look at later. So the benzene vertical separation, we'd say applies to TPH also, just keep it at 15 feet. This is also discussed in EPI's PVI guidance, look at Appendix X, based on reviews of PI PVI database, the maximum vertical screening distances derived from other individual indicator compounds like benzene are also adequate for TPH. So that was it, a, a quick summary 
see for DBI with uh, natural degradation, significantly reduces vapor intrusion risk from patrol. And we've known that for 20 years. Now we have two good guidance documents to, to document that. If you're not sitting right on top of free product within 15 feet, you're, we don't expect to see vapor intrusion problems. Uh, the people can look at that in more detail, see if that's, that's not correct. That's what we see with our data. Not that we have very many sites with data beyond 15 feet. The vapor plumes from jet fuels, diesel water, missile dis middle distillates, lower concentration for gasoline, but they can still pose potential PVI concerns. Vapors are dominated by aliphatics. Uh, we do have toxicity factors. You can uh, generate indoor air and soil gas action or screening levels for vapor intrusion. Benzene usually drives risk for odor releases of gasoline with high benzene content. In the day we looked at, TPH tends to drive PVI risk for middle distillates and newer low benzene gasolines. So even if you reduce benzene down to 10 to minus 6 risk, you still could have TPH problems. That's definitely truer for the heavier fuels you look at. Here's something we'd still emphasize. Small pockets of residual contamination don't pose a long-term PVI risk regardless of the concentration. This is a huge issue at a lot of the UST sites in Hawaii and across the U.S. have been enclosed with small pockets of contamination left in place with seemingly high concentrations of TPH or benzene. But uh, there's just not enough mass within these small pockets of contamination. I, I think 10 cubic yards is a good number for soil to pose a long-term risk. Any short-term risk, you're going to smell it probably even with, with diesel fuel. You, you shouldn't have a long-term risk from these. And then PVI concern can typically be developed or addressed just by removal of gross contamination and then installation of vapor barriers if you do need them. So that was, that was a little bit long, but we, we covered a lot of interesting topics. So any questions you have, I think Jordan mentioned that you can send them through the Zoom comment box. He's going to read them to me at the time we have, and I can stick around as long as you want. And here's the PVI remediation, big one we just did here in Honolulu. Next time you're in town, look at the Lowe's store on Nimitz Highway in Honolulu. It used to be an above-ground gasoline storage tank farm five, 10 feet to ground water. This site was soaked with gasoline. They dug out the gross contamination, used a thermal desorber to treat it in place. Went ahead and put down a liquid boot membrane underneath the entire building, just as an added measure of precaution, put in some passive venting under the slab, and here's the new low store. They don't have a PPI problem. So thanks a lot for joining in. Again, it's, that ran a little bit long, but it's, this will be posted on YouTube. And Jordan, if, if you have any questions that people send in, then I'll be glad to answer them. All right, thanks, Roger. Um, so we've got a few questions here. I uh, just want to go through them from the start. And um, yeah, we'll get going here. Um, yeah, I also want to thank everyone else for joining in, though. Hopefully it was a enjoyable, informative presentation for everybody. Uh, first question up here is, uh, vapors from an open pit were pooled into an HVAC system nearby. Uh, is this petroleum vapor intrusion? Yeah, and that's, I was semi-joking when I called it vapor intrusion. It was vapors intruding a building, but from the HVAC system. So it's not vapor intrusion from the sense that, that we're thinking about. It was, I was just highlighting that as an example of, of a diesel vapors could pose a problem. And I, we do know of one site in Hawaii where we had diesel vapor intrusion problem into a building. Vapors were coming up through a, a rusted out drain in a bathroom, and the bathroom had an exhaust fan. So when you go in the bathroom, it smelled like diesel fuel, and they put in a new drain and fix that problem. Okay, uh, next question. Do any of the breakdown products of petroleum, in particular diesel, play any role in petroleum vapor intrusion risk? Yeah, that's a good question. And I'm not, I don't really have a good handle on the breakdown of petroleum vapors and how that works. That would be a really good study over time to see what's happening there. Or, you know, are you losing all the, the small in lighter range compounds and so you get a higher enrichment of the heavier compounds, C9, and C12, or is, is that going the opposite of the heavier compounds breaking down and generating smaller range compounds? Probably it's the latter case, you're just generating a lot of, of methane. But I'm not sure about the breakdown products for vapors in, in soil gas. I assume that the main concern there is methane and explosive hazards. Okay, thanks, Roger. Uh, next question. Have you conducted any comparisons between SUMA canisters and sorbent tubes uh, using TO17M on a C5 through 12 range? Yeah, we did that in the study. We, all the samples we collected, we ran, we had SUMAs in TO17. And in, in general, you see, in general, they're, they're fairly similar, put it that way. 
you do see some some variability, but it wasn't consistent. Okay. And again, we didn't see much above C12 in our sorbent tube samples. Okay. Okay. Next question: uh, the RFC for C9 through C10 aromatics of 100 micrograms for per cubic meter by the Department of Health is much higher than the 3 and 30. Uh, micrograms per cubic meter for medium and low aromatics published by the EPA. Uh, what's the rationale for our difference? Yeah, for that, I'd, I won't get into too many details. So actually, if you go back to the, the original EPA 2009 document, and they, they published several different reference concentrations or a range of reference concentrations for the heavier aromatics. And based on our review of the, the studies, we were, we were more comfortable using the the higher reference concentration of 100 micrograms per cubic meter for those aromatics. But, you know, the, the toxicity factors, again, I know California is looking at this in more detail. That's something that we need to continue to review. In the end, it's not going to make a huge difference for vapor intrusion we look at just because these aromatics are such a, a minor component of the, the vapors. Okay. Uh, another question here. Uh, from a phase one standpoint, if there is uh, no potential vapor intrusion, is it true to conclude that there is no potential VEC? Huh. VEC. I'm not sure what. I'm not sure what VEC. Is yeah, I tried to get some clarification. Um, haven't heard back on that one, but uh, okay. whoever yeah. asked that question, if you want to send in um uh, explanation of VEC, we can probably give you an answer. Yeah, and yeah, the whole point on this. And the, the really key point of the ITRC guidance and the EPAs also is to be able to screen out these low risk sites. So with that, the screen is free product less than 15 feet, then then you're you're done. And that that's something that would be covered in a, a phase one study. If, if some other situations at the site where that may not be adequately protected, then you look at that in more detail. Okay, uh, we just got a clarification of VEC being vapor encroachment concern. Yeah, and that's, I guess the encroachment would be the lateral migration mm -hmm. from the side. To the, you know, that's something, again, it's probably talking about the 100-foot number, and that's that's pretty general. I don't know if there's that much field data for, for it, but it, it seems to match up with what we see in the field. We haven't seen vape, these petroleum vapor plumes migrate more than 100 feet laterally off of the source. Are they often migrate away from the source? That's, that's very common. Uh, at least I don't know of any specific examples where they've the vapors have gotten more than 100 feet from the source migrating laterally above our action levels. Again, if people have that data, let us know. Okay. All right, we've got time for a few more questions. Uh, one more here. Um, in light of all these fallacies and other data discovery, uh, have we open, reopened any sites based on vapor intrusion issues? You know, we haven't. And that's the, that's the key thing with the ITRC's document and the, and the to look at these vertical separation distances. In, in most UST cases, and even that really 10 feet may, is probably adequate for a lot of these, but most of the USTs that were closed in the 1990s, early 2000s, it's pretty simple in the field. You, you take out the tank, you dig out all the, the stinky soil, so you're removing most of the, the free product in the Vado sun, and you close it up, and you might leave a few tiny pockets of petroleum contamination, especially you know, we're talking about for USTs stay under the corner of a building or something, but only a few cubic yards. So we haven't seen the need to reopen any of our closed UST sites. It's only the ones that have always lingered and they've been under a long-term management plan where they did leave a lot of contamination in place, you know, potentially shallow, that we've gone back and got some soil gas data for that. And then, you know, there's no big surprise, free product within five or 10 feet of the ground surface, you're gonna see elevated vapors. But these sites generally get, you know, when the site gets redeveloped, we haven't found any sites where we've actually discovered a vapor intrusion problem we didn't know about. It's usually an existing or abandoned gas station. And when these properties get redeveloped, then it's in their long-term management plan. You go in and take out any remaining contaminated soil there and take care of the problem. For the UST sites, larger sites, take out as much gross contamination as you can. And if needed, usually it's just an added measure of protection, put in some kind of membrane beneath the floor. And then monitor it and make sure it's not a problem, and then we, we close it out. Okay. Um, Roger, a couple more questions. Uh, can you speak to the effects of temporal heterogeneity on benzene versus aliphatic concentrations? 
Yeah, I wish we had the data for that. That'd be another good field study to do. Uh, we're, I don't know that we're going to do it, but it'd be, a, be good for someone else to look at it. You know, as far as temporal effects on vapor plumes from petroleum, just the same as for solvents, what we've seen at sites is that during the dry season here in Hawaii, or the, say the summer season, as the water table drops, it can expose free product on top of the groundwater that was trapped within, below the groundwater. And then you get a significantly higher vapor concentrations during the, the drier periods of the year. So that's something to keep in mind. If, if you do have free product within 15 feet of the ground surface, you, you may not see anything during the rainy season because it's all buried under the groundwater, but you want to get soil gas data also for the dry season just to clarify or evaluate if it's a potential issue or not. That's the main temporal issue we see. Okay, thanks, Roger. Um, and I think we're just about out of time here, so I'm gonna close things off here. Um, once again, I wanna thank everyone here for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, once again, we'll have some other, uh, another series of two webinars coming up uh, later this year, most likely in either September or, or October. Roger will be discussing his uh, findings from a field study done on discrete samples and in comparison to the collection of incremental samples in soil. Uh, also, uh, it would be a big help for us if uh, anybody who had multiple viewers in their office, uh, if you could just send myself or Roger some numbers on the total number of people who have, you know, viewed today's webinar, it uh, would be great for us just in terms of our record keeping and uh, and grant records. Uh, but yeah, once again, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, you can view slides and the YouTube presentation using the links on this page. I'll leave this up for a little while. Uh, everyone can copy the link. And uh, also, if anyone has a kind of a cool, interesting topic they, they would like to do a presentation on, feel free to let me know. Um, we'd be glad to, you know, consider it and, uh, you know, present it from our end. Hey, thanks a lot, Jordan. Also, we'll be sending out an email letting people know when the, this, this is posted to YouTube and you'll have the link there also. Yeah. Thanks a lot for joining in. Yeah, thank you.